into other people's shoes as you know i am your host neil matthews thank you so much for joining me today want to introduce you to our guest but before i do that just want to call your attention if you haven't done so already please jump right over to your favorite social media of choice whether that be facebook instagram twitter you can find us under the, the handle ops podcast show and if you'd like to hear past present and future episodes you can of course do that at opspodcast.com a little different than the social media but kind of the same name in some respects. Help me welcome in my guest. I get excited when we get to talk to people from Michigan. Why? Well, let me help you. If you're geographically challenged and you're looking at the United States, Michigan kind of looks like a mitten. If you look, kind of, it looks like a mitten. So today we're going to be talking to someone, in fact, from the mitten. He is the lead pastor of E Free Church, which has campuses in Gaylord, Salt, and they're in Marie, Michigan. He also has a vibrant online campus. Now, for those of you in the Michigan area, or maybe are curious about the Michigan area, he is also a Bible teacher that most folks might have listened to on television broadcasts seen weekly in 53 counties throughout northern Michigan. He's also a graduate from Liberty University. He graduated there with a science degree in pastoral ministries, and he also has a degree in ministerial arts degree in religion. He's also served as a pastor for over 33 years in Ohio, O-H-I-O, that's how you spell Ohio, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and now Michigan. In fact, he's passionate about leading his local church to saturating Northern Michigan with the gospel of Jesus by meeting people where they are and moving them to where God wants them to be. Help me welcome in my guest, Scott Disler. Scott, how are you today? Real good. We're, we're enjoying our first snow of the season up here in Northern Michigan. And I told you, you can just go ahead and keep that snow. <laughs> you do not need to FedEx that over to Oregon. You do not. It's okay. You can just hold on to all of that snow because I am not interested. I love to play in the snow. I'm yeah. like Olaf. I want to make a snowman. Right. I'm okay with that. But I'm looking forward to summer, much like he is. So, Scott, welcome in. So, we always like to ask people this question as we kind of lead off our show, and that's this question. Scott, what size shoes do you wear? Eight and a half. All right, eight and a half. And is there a style or brand that you maybe like more than another? I wear Merrells more than anything because up here they keep my feet warm. Now help me with that. Merrells, I've never heard of that that style or that brand before. What is that? Well, it's a brand that's at least up in this direction, but it's more of an outdoor type shoes. You know, they make great waterproof ones and things of that nature. And of course, most of the year we're out in the snow. So having a shoe that keeps your foot dry and warm is a necessity. So Merrill is my shoe of choice because that does it for me. Gotcha. So it's like a boot almost? Well, it can be. They have all different kinds of styles. I don't really do the boot. Uh, I do more of a regular shoe, but it's just designed to keep them warm and keep them dry. Well, that's important, right? <laughs> Up here, especially it is. We get about 150 inches a year. And January and February, we can get 20 to 40 below zero temperatures. You're going to have to have, uh, you don't dress for style up here. You dress for warmth. You don't care what you look like as long as you're warm. So help me with this. Are there like Eskimos? I mean, is it really that cold? Well, there's no Eskimos, but there's actually outside igloos that many of the restaurants and vineyards and wineries have around here. So you you can actually go into a heated igloo to enjoy your meal or whatever. So up here, you have to embrace winter or you're going to go nuts. So that's what they do. So, Scott, help us with this question, because for me, I think on some level, I think has battled with, experienced or somehow come across this idea of a shadow. Right. Now, I know it's fun to, you know, maybe kind of think about like doing shadow puppets and, and shadowy figures like we had Halloween number of months back now. All this time, like I'm thinking even the groundhog, you know, out in Poxitani Phil, out in, right. you know, Pennsylvania area where he sees his shadow or if he doesn't see his shadow, you know, bad things happen, good things happen. And, you know, I could never get that right, by the way. 
For you, have you ever on any level struggled with this idea of a shadow or a presence or this overwhelming feeling that maybe has has followed you and tracked you down? And if so, what was that like for you? Yeah, you know, for me, the biggest one in my adult life, and the thing about this shadow is it's amazing how long I went before I even knew it was there. I'm a pastor, and as a pastor, you know, you, you want to say, here's why I do what I do. But what I discovered really through a hurtful experience, is that I kind of had a shadow mission, uh, something else that was kind of driving me. And it was this, I was basing my sense of significance on my ministry results. Our church was growing. We were the largest church in town. We were the fastest growing church in the denomination. And what I didn't realize is that's where I was getting my self-worth from. My self-worth wasn't coming from who I am in Jesus and my relationship with Jesus like it should as a pastor. It was coming from what are the results? Is the church growing? Are people noticing the church? Is it? Are people talking about the church in a positive way? And it wasn't until I lost that that I realized that had become my shadow mission. That's what I was really doing ministry for. And suddenly I realized I need to regroup on where I'm seeking my sense of significance. So for my whole adult life, until about 10 years years ago, that was really the thing that was driving me and I didn't even realize it was. Now, let's push on that a little bit if we can. I've grown up in the church. I've met a fair amount of pastors. And for me, I guess there's always going to be this stigma and maybe for others as well, that pastors are supposed to have it all together. You're not supposed to have struggles. You're supposed to be the the spokesman, the messenger of God. You're, you're hearing straight from him. You're taking sabbaticals. You're writing books. You're having this quiet time that is none of us normal people can really achieve because you're a pastor and and you don't really have to go to that proverbial eight to five job. You get that one-on-one time with God. So you really shouldn't have any struggles. Is that accurate or am I just way off base in my thinking? Well, it's accurate that that's a stigma, but unfortunately the stigma is not accurate at all. You know, there's two ways people view it. On one hand, people kind of go like a pastor, that's a guy that just works one day a week. On the other side of the coin, it's the people people who put the pastor on that pedestal with that mindset kind of thinking, well, his his prayers reach God more. He always has good thoughts. He always does the right thing. He always has the right answer when I have a problem. And unfortunately, none of that is true. As a pastor, when we first get out of Bible college and seminary, we buy into that stigma. We think that's true about ourselves. It doesn't take long in ministry to realize I've got struggles. I don't know all the answers. I think the problem with it, Neil, is that most people in my church only see me at my best. They see me when I'm up front preaching. They see me when I'm doing a wedding or a funeral. They only see me at my best. If you really want to know what a pastor's like, don't ask his church member, ask his wife, because she sees him even at his worst. I always say that my wife probably knows enough about me to get me fired because she knows the good and the bad. Absolutely. I think that's 100% accurate. So here's where I'm at, especially in ministry. I mean, you hear about not only in ministry, but you hear about Christian leaders, especially nowadays. It seems like more and more we're finding out more and more of their, we'll call it quote unquote shadows. Yes. That they've now allowed to overpower their life. Right. What if you allowed that shadow to really, again, come into your life, take over your life, not become a shadow anymore, but really overtake you as a person? What do you think life would have been like for you? Well, I actually kind of did do that for a while. I think that's part of why I lost that ministry, because that's where my focus was. My my focus was no longer on on relationships, on the individual person in my church. My focus had become about reaching my goals, about numbers. I was very driven. I knew what I wanted to accomplish and I was going to get there. What I didn't realize is that there was a lot of people in my rear view mirror I ran over to get there because I was more focused on my goals than I was the people. And I think the reason I was more focused on it is because that's where I was getting my sense of significance significance was in those results. So it did overtake me even to the point, Neil, where I realized I I became arrogant because what happened is I started looking down at other pastors in town, other pastors in our denomination that had smaller churches. If they were more committed, if they would do it right, 
And suddenly this arrogance formed in my life. I, I kind of deprioritized personal relationships. And though I was hitting home runs on Sunday and we were seeing growth and we were seeing results, I was no longer pastoring the people. And that's how that mission, that shadow overtook me and really brought down my ministry. So Scott, help me with this because Maybe you know this better than I do. The first commandment is what? The first of the Ten Commandments? Yes, To have correct. no other God? And then number two is what? Oh, you're putting me on the spot now. I am. I yeah. am. Little little Old Testament trivia for you. Not, not sure I'm going to get him in order. How's that for a good pastor? See, pastors know everything, right? You know, obviously, he's a jealous God. We know this. You know this. Don't worship anything but me. And don't put anything before him. Be number two, I think. So obviously, in that, the reason why I bring that up, do you feel like you were worshiping? worshiping yourself and do you think you feel like you were putting yourself above him in any respect and if so maybe speak to that isn't it amazing how even ministry can become an idol and it really did in my life it became an idol when i woke up in the morning my my first thought my my passion for the day was not love god with all my heart soul and mind like jesus said is the greatest commandment my passion was accomplish the goals grow the church find ministry success as a result i think you're exactly right me I made that an idol. That's what I was worshiping more than my own personal relationship with God. The problem was I didn't see it. I didn't see that I was doing that until the whole thing came crashing down. And that's when I realized I had a problem and I needed to repent of that problem because I was worshiping an idol of ministry success. Do you feel in any way you were worshiping yourself? Oh, without question. I think the two go together. And that's even where that arrogance came in. Because why were we having success? Well, I would have given you, I'm sure, the pat answer, well, God's blessing us. But I think in my heart, it was because I was doing so much and I was so committed and I had all the right ideas. And uh, so without question, I think the two go together. Whenever you begin to worship your ministry, I think it's almost impossible to do that without worshiping yourself and elevating your yourself as well. And that's where that arrogance really crept in. Well, here's the thing. Not everyone else is a pastor. Right. If you don't mind sharing, how large was that congregation? It was about 1,500 people at the time. Do you think your congregants on any level, especially the men, we'll, we'll call out the men in this moment. Do you think any of your congregants were maybe struggling with the same type of issue that you were? And if so, do you feel like you were a great pastoral shepherd to maybe help walk them through those same challenges? Yeah. Yeah. And I think many of them were were in two facets. Some of them were in their own lives because that's also their idol, their business success, their career success. I actually think I propagated people doing the same thing even with ministry in the church because all I talked about was numbers. All I talked about was our numbers, the number of converts, the number of growth, the percentage of growth. Unfortunately, what that does is that begins to say to the people, that's what ministry success is. It's all about numbers. We go after numbers, we go after growth. And I think I gave them a warped view of what ministry really is. So I think I propagated it in several ways by my own example. I'm imagining as a pastor, you've probably counseled a few people through the years, right? Sure. All right. So be my counselor for a moment. I'm noticing just based on the Zoom, looks like maybe we're in an office of yours. If, if I were to kind of project behind you. Right. So I walk into your office and I say, Scott, listen, I, I got a problem. 45,433 people approximately have downloaded my show to date on my podcast. Which download is the most important and should it be for me? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. I think in my mind, that kind of goes back to what the religious leaders in Jesus' day were doing. There were 613 commandments in the Pentateuch. And the Pharisees of Jesus, they loved to categorize them. They categorized them as heavy and light, right? Heavy was the ones you could never fudge on. Light, maybe you could fudge on. But they also categorized them as what's the most important. And they loved to debate that. And that's what they used to try to trap Jesus. And Matthew 22, when they say to Jesus, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? Because whatever answer Jesus was going to give, a bunch were going to disagree with him. He was going to alienate people. But Jesus gave the perfect answer. Basically, he'd have to think about it. That's easy. It's that you love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and might. Now, when he did that, he was quoting from Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, the Shema, which those religious leaders recited out loud every morning and every night. 
And he's saying to them, look, the greatest commandment is the one you guys recite out loud every morning, every night. It's the one you wear in the phylacteries that you put on your head and you have on the doorposts of your house. And so really the bottom line is this. There's only one greatest commandment. You love God with all your heart, soul, mind. The second one, he says, you love your neighbors yourself. And then he adds this phrase, on those two things, all the law and the prophets rest. Why? Because every commandment in the Bible either shows you how to love God or love others. So this question you asked to me is very similar. Which one is the greatest download? Well, at the end of the day, the only download that matters is, did you do it? your show out of a love for God and was God pleased, not just with your actions, but also with your motive, why you did it. I think you answered that one well, by the way. Sorry, I got preaching a little bit. You go. It's all right. I was going to say we're here to preach for a moment. So that's all right. I'm okay with that. But the reason why I bring that up, and maybe this will help a little bit too, is when I was struggling a while back, much like you from the sound of it, so I'm glad I'm not, I I wasn't alone. However, I wish we would have known each other back then because I wondered what your advice would have been then. And and maybe it's the same. I don't know. But for me, I was sharing with a fellow podcaster. I was like, listen, like my show isn't getting downloaded. Like nobody's listening. Oh, whoa. We're, you know, rolling around in the proverbial mud puddle, right? Right. This guest informed me, and it was a guest of all things. She asked me this question. She said, which download is most important to you? And I was like, I don't I don't know. And she said, it doesn't matter. Mm. And really, it's the one download. Like the one. I have way more than one. I mean, obviously, I just shared. And she said, it's the one person, it's the one download that somebody comes back and says, you made a difference. Does wow. that happen to you? <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, of course it has. I mean, I can... I have all kinds of stories where that's happened. And she said, then what does it matter? Then what does it matter? And I was like, oh my goodness, you're right. And by the way, she's a doctor. You didn't know this doctor, but you did have this kind of wake up moment. Tell me about that wake up moment for you when you realized, listen, Scott was worshiping himself. Scott was making himself and the ministry, perhaps an idol, a God. Bad men have created cults. Not saying you were creating a cult per se, but I don't want to go there. But others have done that. The Jim Joneses of the world, the David Koresh's of the world. That's what absolute power does corrupt. We've seen that even on government levels. Hello. But what was that breaking moment for you? Maybe that that diagnosis moment for you. What was that like? It ended up being the most hurtful time in my life. And, and what happened, Neil, is I had been at that church in Pennsylvania for five years. We had seen great growth, 500 to 1,500 people in five years. And we the sky seemed to be the limit. We had great plans moving forward when one day the most influential person in the church was my board chairman, was actually the one responsible for bringing me to the church, had been my greatest cheerleader for five years, suddenly, seemingly overnight, turned against me. I'm still not sure to this day exactly what caused it, other than I think obviously God was working. I I kind of referred to him as a well-intentioned dragon, uh, which isn't my original term. Martin Shelley wrote a book by that. In other words, I think his intentions were, were very good. He saw a problem. He saw some of my my blind spots that I didn't see, the way he went about it was very destructive. So he's a well-intentioned dragon. And so he began with the secret meetings and kind of picking off board members and staff members and key people in the church. And again, because I had been so focused on results and not relationships, they weren't hard to pick off because I didn't have strong relationships with those individuals. As a result, I end up going into what I call the cave where ministry becomes misery. I'm experiencing fear. I'm experiencing isolation as I pull away from everyone, uh, self-pity, hopelessness, and ultimately it ends with my losing that ministry. First time in my ministry life, I had gotten basically fired. And at that moment, I'm at rock bottom and I'm hurt because of the way it happened. And as I continued to move through that, and I was out of ministry for about six months, I end up getting to a point where I could process it and get beyond processing what they did to me and really answer the question, what did I do wrong? What do I need to learn? What do I need to change? And that was probably almost as 
difficult as going through the event itself was to really honestly deal with that. And that's when God showed me that the problem was just what we talked about earlier. My source of significance was in ministry results. That's what I was putting as my passion. Uh, That was my idol. As a result, when I lost that, I suddenly had no sense of significance. I was at my lowest even spiritual. And then along with that, God shows me that how arrogant I had become in so many different ways. And so it was really going through that cave experience that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy, but God used in my life to reveal to me those shadow missions that I had to allow me to repent from that so that I could move on in ministry and not have that shadow controlling me. Now, that shadow likes to rear its ugly head still. It likes to still tempt me to do that. And I have to be careful because I know I can easily fall back into that. But it was that cave experience that God used to really show me those issues. What if you had had, and I know it's easy to go back and write, play that what if proverbial hindsight 2020. I mean, everyone does that, I think, on some level, right? So you probably know different. I've done it for 10 years. But in that moment, like if you had had deeper discipleship relationships, if you had had deeper rooted connections with not only the men in your church, but the leaders in your church, would that have, would that shadow have overtaken you in your mind? You know, it's hard to say for sure, but here's the thing I think would have made a difference. If I would have had those close relationships, there were other people that saw that shadow, saw those blind spots, but I didn't have a close enough relationship with anyone for them to speak speak that into my life, to come to me and show me that in a way that I knew they really loved me and they were wanting to try to help me and to really someone I had enough relationship with to listen to. Now, would I have listened? I don't know. I hope I would have. I think I would have had a better chance. Unfortunately, the only person who would reveal that to me did it in a destructive way. What I really needed was people I was close to who could speak that into my life and say, listen, I I remember giving an example. I remember when I was pastoring back in Indiana. I had a couple guys who I met with every week and we developed that kind of relationship. And I can remember them saying to me one time, they said, Scott, can we be really honest with you? And I said, sure. And they said, you are accomplishing so much, but what you don't realize is you're running over people to get there. And there's people who want to have a relationship with their pastor, but they can't because you're so focused and you just blow right by them to accomplish your goals. That helped temporarily, okay? Because I had those guys who could speak into my life. Unfortunately, when I went to Pennsylvania, I got so consumed because the growth came immediately. I got so consumed with that that I did not make it a priority to develop those relationships. I think, Neil, it could have helped. I just don't know if I would have been humble enough to really listen and really respond. Wow. I don't think I've ever had a pastor admit that they had a struggle with humility. Every pastor has two struggles I, I found. I know I do. I'm a, Many I've talked to do too. One is humility and the other one is insecurity. And we deal with both of those all the time. It's almost an oxymoron. All right. So let's go back in time a little bit. First Kings, I'm putting you on the spot again. This is some Bible trivia. Here we go. First Kings. Okay. I had to Google this to make sure I was accurate in my, in my, because when I give a Bible verse, I'm going to make sure I'm right. Right. I don't want to just go off the top of head. <laughs> sure. Right. So this is scripture. First Kings chapter 19, verse 11 through 13. You can look at it later if you want, but it says the powerful wind tore the mountain apart. It shattered the rocks before, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he put his cloak over his face and went and stood at the mouth of the cave. Are you any different than Elijah in this moment? I I really don't think so. I mean, you you think back, I think Elijah in the Bible is the first one to find that cave I referenced. And and by the way, for Elijah, very similar, Neil, he just came off a great ministry success, stood on Mount Carmel, fire down from God. You know, he's on, he'd be on the cover of Christianity Today in his time, right? He could go on the speaking circuit, think of the podcast downloads he could get, right? But the very next chapter, he's in 
in a cave going, God, just kill me. I'm the only one. No one else serves you like I serve you. I think Elijah struggled with some of those same things until God spoke to him in that way. And that started a turning point in Elijah's life. Much like you, right? Very much like me. I, I think the, the stories mirror each other. I had one dragon in my life. So did he. Her name is Jezebel. You know, I just had ministry success. So did he. My response to everything was exactly like his. I'm going to pull away from everybody. I'm going to go in the cave. I'm going to experience self-pity. He also had fear, and I did too. I, I think there's a complete harmony within the two stories. So help me with this, because I think there's two major, well, I mean, there's probably more than two, but there's two that I really like. There's two major colleges kind of in your area, right? You got the University of Michigan, the big house in Ann Arbor. You ever been there, by the way? I have. You've been inside the stadium? Not inside okay, the stadium. But, but you've no, been, been to been it. Been to it. Okay. So a hundred. You got to understand, you got to stand there. I live in Michigan, but I'm from Ohio. I'm an Ohio State fan. I think I would break out in hives if I went to that stadium. This is really going to be amazing then. I love this question already <laughs> now. All right. Awesome. <laughs> love it. We got the big house, which you would probably break out in hives with. By the way, 102,000 plus nothing against the horseshoe just saying way more people in the big house i understand that but a little ways maybe down from you in east lansing there's this other stadium right spartan stadium you probably heard of that too right break out in hives in that one as well not as much i, I can deal with those hives I, I really kind of enjoyed them when they knocked off michigan again so anyway but that's another story but in East Lansing, because I feel like we got to stay in the mitten. We're in the mitten. We got to be in the mitten. Right. I don't like Ohio State. I'm not even going to entertain the horseshoe. Just saying. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going there. But in East Lansing, right, they have Spartan Stadium. Right. And by the way, seating capacity, 75,005 people. I don't know how we can't like, get up to the 100 Michigan State. Come on, let's go. Five. We, we just got these five lonely people standing <laughs> out there. <laughs> That's for the visiting team. Uh, maybe, maybe that's maybe that's where the Buckeyes are. Ooh, <laughs> could only get the Buckeyes in there. Anyway, so if we put you fifty yard line, that big Spartan logo out in the middle there, and we get people who have struggled with this idea of worshiping themselves. Which, hello, who on the planet isn't in this stadium at this moment? Who maybe have forfeited in a lot of respects ministry because of their own choices? And we made you the keynote speaker. What would you say to this crowd now? Again, I'm not a Spartans fan per se, and I, I know you're not either, but that logo is kind of intimidating. It is kind of calling people to arms, to calling people to fight. The armor of God comes to mind, the helmet of salvation. What would you say to those folks in that moment? The biggest thing I would say to those who have experienced what I experienced, worshiping themselves, it comes crashing down, good or bad reasons behind all that. The one thing I would say to them is that is part of your story but it's not the end of your story. And I think we have to realize that. Unfortunately, as we look at our own stories, there are things in our stories that we don't like and we wish we would have done differently, but we can't let that become the end of our story. I easily could have done that. I could have said, okay, I'm done with ministry. I'm not cut out for it. This isn't working, what have you. But instead, God used that time in my life, that brokenness to prepare me for a new ministry. I think about, in the Bible, every time Jesus distributes bread, feeding of the 4,000, feeding of the 5,000, Last Supper, he always uses the same method. He takes the bread, he blesses the bread, he breaks the bread, he gives the bread. And, you know, I think that's how God works with people. He takes us, he blesses us, gives us gifts, gives us ministries. But I think there comes a time in our life, and often it's by our own doing, he allows us to be broken. Brokenness isn't the end of the story. I think the idea is he wants to break us, allows to be broken so he can give us a fresh and a new. So the brokenness, whether it was because of the mistreatment of others, whether it was because of our own shadow mission or a combination of the two, it's part of your story, but it doesn't need to be the end of your story. There is still ministry life ahead. There still can be joy in ministry ahead. That's really, when you think of Elijah, that's what God ends up doing. He basically says, Elijah, it's time to get up. It's time to get back in the game. 
it's time to get back in ministry. He even brings a good friend to come alongside of him in Elisha to help him as he mentors Elisha. And that's the biggest thing I would want to say is, I know it's part of your story, and I know it's a part of your story you'd like to forget, but it was an important part of your story. And God doesn't waste anything. He doesn't waste anything. It's not the end of your story. Let's return to what God's called us to do. Let's believe God to give us that in a new, fresh way. Let's learn from our brokenness and hopefully also be able, on the second part of that, is to help others. Second Corinthians 1 says that God comes alongside of us in our trials so we can come alongside of others who go through the same trial. And I love that. God doesn't comfort us to make us comfortable. He comforts us to make us comforters. We have to get back into ministry, whatever that looks like. We have to get back into it. When, when my wife and I were going through this time period, there was a prayer we prayed every day. And that was this, God, when this is all over, our prayer is we'll be more in love with you than we are now, more in love with each other than we are now, and more in love with the church than we are now. Because many people walk away from one or more of those things. I believe that God doesn't waste anything. Yes, that's part of your story, but God can use that part of your story for the rest of your story. I was profound about the uh, the Lord's Supper and, and blessing of the the bread. I, I had never even thought about that until this moment. So I think it was A.W. Tozer who said, it's doubtful God can ever really use someone till he breaks someone. I think that's all part of it. And sometimes we bring that brokenness on ourselves. No doubt about that, but it's not the end of our story. Whether you took it a little bit from A.W., it's good. Well, you know, the, us pastors, we got to steal from each other. We have no material, you know? So, Scott, here's my question. I always ask as, as a kind of a follow-up to the stadium question, which some people have begun to not like so much, but I like this stadium question just for those that have sent in not so much loving mail. I won't <laughs> call it hate mail, but maybe some, some feedback mail. I like this stadium question. The stadium question is a good staple. So, Scott, in that moment, Spartan fans or not, maybe they're wearing green, maybe they're not. Do you feel like people would hear you in that moment and really apply what you said to their life? Or do you think they'd just walk away going, man, the Scott guy, yes, but very good stuff. No plan, no, no further steps would ever be taken. Speak to that maybe if you wouldn't mind. It depends. It, it's going to depend, number one, on why they're in the stadium. Um, why are they there? Do they, do they desire to move on? Do they desire to change? Have they even honestly looked at their own life to say, have I repented of the things that I had shadows dealing with me on? That's part of it. I think another part of it is if I can connect with them in the sense of saying, I've been there. A guy speaking on marriage who's never been married. That, that's not what I'm doing. I'm a guy who's been where you are. I've experienced the brokenness. I've had harsh reality of seeing what my shadow was and having to make the decision. Do I acknowledge that? Do I repent from it? Do I change it? Do I move on? Even though it's scary to move on. A lot of fear in that. And I think those two things together make the connection. If I can make them see that I've been there, I'm not just speaking to speak. I understand what you're going through. But I think the biggest thing, though, is do they really want to change? Have they really even accepted the fact that they were part of the problem, their brokenness also included their own shadows and shadow missions that maybe some of them haven't even acknowledged yet. And do they really want to move on? I think it has to be a combination of the two. Three lessons, perhaps, that you really walked away with from that experience that you still carry with you to this day. You mentioned scars. Maybe those lessons are, in fact, scars for you. What are they? The biggest one I learned, again, let's get back to relationships. Ministry is, at its core, relationships. That's what it is. And I understand that the bigger the church, the harder it is to build relationships. And I can't build relationships with everyone. Impossible. But there's a saying I heard someone say one time, I took to heart, and it was this, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Okay, you may not be able to do it forever, but do for one. I can build those relationships with my staff. I can build those relationships with my board. I can build those relationships with my board chairman. And I have made that the last 10 years here in Michigan a priority. And I have a great relationship with them today. One where they can speak truth into my life. And I think one in which they would also uh, be more prone to protect me. And, and, and I think that's important as well. That's a huge lesson that I learned right there. The second lesson I learned is this. Though numbers matter, 
And, and they do. I mean, they're metrics and you want to know, are we make, are we doing things right? Do we need to change things? You're not going to throw the whole thing out, but I cannot make that the litmus test. I'm glad I realized that because with COVID the last year and a half, no one's bragging about their numbers. You, you know what I'm saying? And if my sense of significance was all about numbers, this would have really been a difficult year and a half. That was a big one that I really had to understand. I think the other one I had to really learn, because even though part of this was caused by my shadow, there still was hurt by the way it was dealt with. I had to learn what forgiveness was. And this was a tough one, Neil, because I think we've been taught wrong our whole lives. We can all finish the statement. We were taught forgiveness means you forgive and you forget. Number one, that's not in the Bible. And number two, it's not possible. That's not forgiveness. You don't forget. Forgiveness is this. Even though I remember it, and even though I'm tempted to bring it back up to use as a weapon against you, I choose not to. That's forgiveness. And that was probably the hardest lesson that I had to learn. Now, I know you can't answer for her, but maybe she shared with you on some level. Does your wife still view you as a pastor despite all of the shadow, despite all of the challenges, despite the ministry reset and the, the moving around? Does she still, in your mind, view you as a pastor? Without question, my wife is my biggest cheerleader, which is great because, again, she knows all my weaknesses as well. She's seen me at my worst as well, but she's still my biggest cheerleader. And my wife will be the one, and she has said it many times, to say, she says, Scott, you're a better pastor today because of what we went through. You're a better pastor because it's caused you to change some things in how you do ministry. I would say today, I told you about that prayer we prayed before that we'd be more in love with God, more in love with each other, more in love with the church. And Neil, by the grace of God, I can say God answered that prayer. My wife and I are more in love with Jesus today than we've ever been. We are more in love with each other than we've ever been. And we are more in love with the local church than we've ever been. I want to give you an opportunity right now why the book? Why write the book? I mean, there's there's so many books about pastoring out there. I mean, I'm sure if we did, just did a Google search or even an Amazon search, I mean, we're going to find guy a guy in Houston, I'm sure. I think you know who I'm referring to. That's probably written a few books about pastoring or about churches or about, you know, your best life now. Just a little, <laughs> not trying to plug him per se. What would you say to that? Why write it? Because, I mean, again, there's so many out there. And I think the main reason I wrote it, Neil, was that 2 Corinthians 1 passage. That God comes alongside of us in our trials so we can come alongside of others who go through the same trial. When I went through this whole cave experience, I learned lessons and lessons that I think can help other people get back out of the cave, get back into ministry and get back to their calling. And what I wanted to be able to do, because one of the things God did over the last um, 10 years is he, he's put a new passion in my life, which is to come alongside of hurting pastors. That's a new passion I have. And and when I get a chance to talk with a hurting pastor, pray with a hurting pastor, counsel a hurting pastor, I love doing that. And I wanted to have a tool that I could give them that would give them spiritual hope, but it was also give them practical help. Book does not talk about how I got hurt. That's not important. It talks about the lessons I learned. And so the main reason I wrote the book was so that I had a tool to give to other hurting pastors that God brought into my life. Now, by the grace of God, has helped other people too, but that's the main reason. So I could have a stack of books in my office that when God brings a hurting pastor into my life or I hear of one, I have a tool to send them that I hope God can use to help them. That's why I wrote the book. So I downloaded this new app, which I'm, I'm really loving, by the way. I don't know if if others download apps from time to time and they like them and then they delete them. This one, I I think, might stay on my phone. So this just popped through quite literally as we're talking on my phone. It said, love me without restriction, trust me without fear, want me without demand, and accept me for who I am. When you hear that, what comes to mind? That is how God responds to us. One of my favorite verses that I, I, I love to share with people is from Romans 15, 7, that says we are to accept, and that was part of that quote, we're to accept one another as God accepted us. Now, how did God accept us? Well, when, when I came to him and said, I know I'm a sinner, I put my faith in Jesus, he didn't look at me and say, well, wait a second, there's some things I need you to change first, then come to me and I'll think about accepting you. And he says, now that's how I want you to deal with people. See, I think one of the greatest mistakes we make is we say to people, if you change, I'll accept you. Instead of saying, 
I'm going to start by accepting you and believe that God's going to use that relationship to bring change into your life and my life. So when I hear that quote, my mind immediately goes to the power of acceptance. When, when I counsel people getting married, I say to them, if I can only give you one verse, that's the verse I would give you. Don't go into your marriage trying to change each other. That doesn't work. But you know what happened when God accepted me? That started the process of change in my life. Acceptance brings change. So that's the part that really stuck out to me when you gave that quote. Well, and I think that's such a powerful statement, even in your own story, right? Is when you finally started accepting people, yeah. you real change really took place. Without question. So, Scott, thank you so much for being on today. We're going to play a game together. You like games, right? You're f- Absolutely. Okay. I ho- I really hope so. So, we kind of mentioned Ohio State. So, that, that implies a little bit that you might be a sports fan. I am. Maybe you can help me with this. Do you recognize this team, per se? Yeah, the North Carolina Tar Heels. Okay. Are you a Tar Heels fan, admittingly, right now, in this moment? Um, no, I'm, I'm I'm neutral when it comes to the target. Because that's the thing, about, the thing about sports. You know, sometimes it's funner to hate a team than it is to love a team. Well, when it comes to North Carolina, I'm neutral. Okay, but you got to help me. Do you like them more or less than the Duke Blue Devils? Just asking for a friend. Well, that's, that's a good question. And, and I can say this to you. When it comes to college basketball and North Carolina plays Duke, I always pull for North Carolina. Because you can't root for the Not, devil, right? It, <laughs> well, you know what's interesting? Gaylord High School, where I live, they're the Blue Devils, all right? So I'm a pastor that has to yell, go Devils. So anyway. That's awkward. That's, <laughs> that's really awkward. <laughs> I might have to write your church on that one. Or their high school. Oh, 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 trust me, I get the emails about that. <laughs> I don't think I could ever do that. I would, <laughs> I would sit there with my North Carolina stuff on and, and not. But I would still, but I would still accept you and hope that change would come into your life. Stop. People have tried. <laughs> it's one change that's never going to happen, Pastor. Sorry. All right. So back to you. So I couldn't find okay. my Ohio State Cup. I guess it was on back order. I don't know from Amazon. Uh, yeah, you so. never. That's because I bought them all. All right. Fair enough. So we're going to play this game called Senseless. All right, I'm going to roll for you. Are you good with me rolling on your behalf? Go ahead. Okay, so you got a number one, despite the North Carolina logo there. It's a North Carolina dive, too, by the way. It's really bad out, as you can kind of tell. This is so weird to me. You saw the one. Yeah. I didn't trick it. I didn't, like, move my hand. Of course, you couldn't see that, but you, you really got to trust uh, Yeah, this. I'm, I'm going to trust you. All right, so here's my question, and, and it's a game called Senseless. Like I said, typically we have five senses, and then six of those are wild cards. So the questions are based on our senses, right? It's just a fun way to end the show. And this is your question. It's so fitting. It says, how do you want others to see you? It's kind of ironic because we feel like we've been talking about that already, but we've been kind of hinting around at this issue. But how do you really want others to see you? I think I would kind of put it down to one thing. I I hope others will be able to say, sure, he had weaknesses and quirks, but he was faithful to his God. And I take that from the Bible verse, that the one thing that God requires of a steward is that we be found faithful. And that's really, at the end of the day, what my goal is. I want to be faithful to what God's called me to do. That's fantastic. So Scott, if people are interested, maybe they do know a pastor in their life that has walked away or has been hurt or has that scar or maybe a pastor that has been battling, you know, the shadow. How can people reach out and and know more about the book and maybe where can they go to get the book? You can get the book online, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, Books a Million, and pretty much through any local bookstore, though I'm sure they don't carry it, they could find it and order it for you. So that's where it's readily available. And and if you ever want to reach out to me, you they can email me and that would be skdisler at gmail.com. If they have a question or maybe there's a pastor who's downloaded this and says, man, that's where I'm at. And I just need to talk to somebody who's been there. Email me. We'll set up a a way we can get together, be it a call, a Zoom, whatever it is. I would love to be able just to encourage you, pray with you. And if God can use me to help you in your cave experience, that's a passion God's given. That's fantastic, Scott. I appreciate that a lot. So guys and gals, kids and campers alike, we have sadly reach the end. I always get kind of sad and, and a little, I don't want to say depressed, but but I do get a little sad when I get to leave a guest because I feel like we have had such a moment. And I think this is no exception. I've been in that cave. I've been in that dark moment. I didn't know Scott back then, but I wish I did. So I'm going to speak to you right now. You who are in that moment. 
you who are in that cave, you who are allowing voices maybe. And we can scratch out voices and we can put shadow. We can scratch out shadow and we can put secret. We can scratch out secret and we can put in whatever you want. It could even be fill in the blank. I always hate those because I never know what to fill in sometimes. So I'm going to leave that up to you right now. What is your fill in the blank moment right now? Think about that. What have you been hiding from? What have you been running from? What are you scared of? Is there a a vulnerability issue in your life. Think about that for a moment. Got it? I hope you do. Take a moment right now to really ask yourself, is there somebody in my life that I can really give this stuff to? Now, I know Scott and I were talking about God. Maybe you have had a bad experience with God. Maybe that's your person. Maybe that's your thing. Can I just encourage you in this moment? Really research that out. Really ask yourself that question. And maybe it's not God. Maybe it's a church. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a I don't know who, again, I don't know who your blank is, but I'm going to ask you, is that blank so long, so deep that you can't get past? Forgiveness is a powerful tool. And I know we talk about it quite often on this show, but I mean it. It is a tool that can be used to truly bring healing, but it starts with a step. So this week, here's your question. What step are you going to take to get out of the cave? What step are you going to take to finally say, okay, here I am out in the open, ready to receive what you have for me. And let me tell you right now, it is going to be scary and it is not going to be fun. But sometimes, Linus, with your blanket, Charlie Brown reference there, you got to step out. You got to let go of the blanket and you got to step out and really, truly accept who you were made to be. Let that be your challenge today. Step out of the cave. Step out of the darkness. Step out of the shadow. Just want to remind you of that. Remember, do not ever, ever, ever forget. Do not forget. Remember, when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. Thank you so much for listening and stay tuned till next week when we walk in other people's shoes.